Recording is on. Welcome to the strangest of all interview with Dr. Gregory Benford. My name is Julie Novakova, and it's uh, my pleasure uh, to announce uh, that we will be interviewing this amazing author who kindly agreed to contribute two of his stories to my astrobiological science fiction anthology, Strangest of All. For those of you who haven't yet heard of the anthology, uh, it contains science fiction stories connected by the theme of astrobiology, and each of the stories is accompanied by a non-fiction piece written by me about the science in the story and also includes some tips for classroom use in case of uh, using the book in formal education. And the book is available for free on my website, julinovakova.com, and on the website of the European Astrobiology Institute, for which I have edited the book, europeanastrobiology.eu. And it's also my pleasure to introduce Dr. Benford here. Uh, he's one of the best known authors of science fiction today. He published over 20 novels, the most famous of which are in the series In the Ocean of Night. And uh, he is also a scientist, a physicist, currently a professor uh, at the University of California in Irvine. And he has also been very active in science education throughout all of his uh, scientific and writing career. So uh, thank you, Dr. Benford, for uh, accepting my invitation to interview you. Happy to be here. And uh, my first question uh, ties to all of your careers and also to the anthology. And it's about using science fiction in STEM education. Uh, how do you think that science fiction can contribute to uh, outreach and education in science and technology? And what are some of the good or possibly bad examples that you could give? Children are innately imaginative. So getting into their minds with an imaginative subject is simple, easy, and they like it. Um, Education often manages to hammer that out of them over time, <laughs> but therefore it's best to get into the minds of children and inspire them with the enormous worldview of science before their minds close up and they become <clears throat> ordinary adults and boring people. Um, so uh, it's always struck me, since that's how I came to science, through science fiction, that uh, this, this avenue is underexploited in our culture, uh, but through my lifetime, I have seen science fiction go from a small little niche genre to a commanding uh, view in world culture through everything, movies and so forth. Unfortunately, I don't think it's read enough in books, but it's certainly seen enough on screen. So this is a unique opportunity, the emergence of a new genre, new to most people, into the world culture in a way that we've seldom seen before in human history. Uh, I always think that um, one or two new cultural innovations have occurred over the last several centuries in at least the Western countries. And in the 20th century, the, there's been a surplus in a way because Film, for example, is a 20th century invention and it came to be a major cultural influence. Science fiction came along with film. Of course, there are other genres, there's a jazz and rock and roll and so forth and music. But it's seldom you see a genre emerge and take command of uh, the world culture so swiftly. Primarily, I think, because it, it gives you wonderful images, but also because it gives you new ideas. Yeah. On the other hand, uh when we saw, uh, when we see science fiction in movies, it's usually films that have little in common with actual science and technology. And actually, you have experience with Hollywood and uh, wrote about it in your essays. So, uh, how do you think that we can use SF uh, to educate about science and to improve critical thinking? Uh, you know, when most of science fiction doesn't tie much to real world science. Yes. Science fiction 
is probably best encountered uh, in framing it as a puzzle, as a mystery. Of course, there's already a mystery genre, but in media treatments of mysteries, for example, very few people seem to ever know anything about the laws of evidence. <laughs> but in science fiction, they don't seem to know the laws of nature. So uh, the way to proceed, I think, uh, is in a recent film, for example, Arrival, uh, built on the science fiction short story by Ted Chiang, uh, you are obsessed through the film with the problem of alien communication, which is one of the great themes of science fiction. Um, and that's therefore exemplary. Uh, there are other, well, bad examples. For example, long ago, the Andromeda strain gets the biology wrong. I mean, they solve the problem at the end by having the, the incredible disease mutate and become harmless, which seldom happens in the real world. Well, actually, the virulence uh, typically decreases, uh, but, you know, few pathogens go completely harmless. And, yeah. of course, depends on many factors. But, I mean, uh, take the common cold. It's basically harmless to most people and it spreads very easily. So you have kind of this trade-off of uh, virulence and uh, uh, how uh, the pathogen spreads, you know. True, but there's a new flu every year and a new vaccine. It, it's, a, it's an arms race between us yeah. and the biosphere. And of course, always between the host and the parasite. Right. But when you mentioned arrival, uh, it got me thinking about the question of communication with hypothetical alien civilizations, which is, of course, one of the great questions of science fiction, and also one of the questions that astrobiology ponders in the long time horizon and the eventuality that we, for instance, happen to detect uh, a radio or a laser signal by another civilization. So. Uh, how do you think we should go about uh, trying to detect these signals in the future? Uh, as, of course, your story, Seti for Profit, uh, <laughs> suggested one possible approach. <laughs> yes, it's about the motive. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, of course, I've already worked on this with my, my twin brother and my nephew and saying, look, uh, smart Seti broadcasters will send you quick pulses to catch your attention and they won't broadcast everywhere at great expense. So those kinds of searches, I think, are, are now starting to be done and will be more of those in the future. Uh, my brother has also uh, published just last year, I think, a paper called Looking for Lurkers, which points out that we haven't really looked for our alien artifacts that might have come to survey our planet over the last billion years or so, and are, for example, set up perhaps on the moon the opening theme of the movie, 2001, or in a new class of bodies only discovered about 20 years ago, so-called uh, uh, co-orbitals, which are asteroid-like objects that have strange odd uh, repeating orbits to bring them near the Earth. We didn't even know about these until uh, the early parts of this century. But it's an obvious place where you would put an observing post to look at the biosphere, because over the last billion years, it's been clear to anyone with a telescope around a star passing reasonably nearby that uh, the Earth has a biosphere and it might be fun to study it. So you send a robotic craft and it parks somewhere and it sends back information and eventually it dies. But the artifact is left. In 2001, the artifact is active. But probably, uh, if you go to a lurker or to the moon, you would find a dead artifact and remember, you're getting a sampling time of a billion years. So the probabilities get much higher for you just because, uh, unlike, say, SETI and listening to messages, all you get sampling is the present moment. Yeah. So that's a huge advantage. You see, we've got to think about this not just as a scientific strategy, but try to think about, since we're talking about all your intelligent life, what intelligent life elsewhere will do to optimize their return. That is, make the transmissions cheaper, and if you send exploratory craft, get some information that you need, uh, but don't make a craft that will last forever or any of the other extravagant things. 
So it's a matter of looking at it as a process in, in a, an interaction between two cultures instead of just a bunch of artifacts. Yeah. But on the other hand, the interaction will most likely happen at uh, a very slow pace with very long pauses in between. So wow. uh, you touched the theme of composing messages that uh, outlast time scales uh, that most humans live in and imagine in your book, Deep Time. So uh, what do you think is the best way of composing a message that might outlast humanity or humanity as we know it and be delivered to some hypothetical other civilization? Well, there are many pathways. Uh, of course, I wrote an entire book about this called Deep Time, how humanity communicates across millennia. Just looking at how we did it, and of course, the major way we have done it uh, uh, you used to leave artifacts, I mean, uh, the pyramids, uh, tombs and graves, uh, almost all of the, what we learn about the ancient world are actually uh, building built in service of the dead. A few people think about that. Of course, there's always a Colosseum and, and the, the Parthenon and so forth. But you learn most from tombs and skeletons and mummies. So, uh, if there's a fair chance, I think, that you might look out into the galaxy and see robotic radiating systems around other stars from civilizations that may have lost interest or died out or something, but they've got the handy robots and a power source so they keep broadcasting. Um, that's one path to follow. Uh, the hard thing for most people is to get in mind the vast time scale of our universe, after all, it's almost 13 billion years, and the, gra the great distance scale. So science fiction, for example, uses shortcuts, faster than light travel, and so on. But that's a narrative device. It doesn't reflect the truth, because of, uh, it doesn't look good for faster than light travel. It doesn't, yeah. But all when you talked about deep time, you also reminded me uh, that uh, one of the chapters was about the environment and your Nebula Vinink novel, uh, Timescapes, uh, was uh, about a similar theme, scientists sending uh, a message from uh, late 20th century to scientists in the 60s about an environmental crisis and trying to make it right in uh, another universe. True. So, uh, uh, do, do you think that uh, if we actually had the capability to send back a message in time, that it would have made a difference? Because if we look, for instance, at anthropogenic climate change, there has been evidence for it quite a long time. The evidence is mounting and uh, it doesn't look very good for uh, human cities and uh, infrastructure and so on and uh, for many endangered species. So uh, do you think that if we could send a best, uh, message about this back, let's say, 50 years ago, uh, would it have mattered because the evidence was already there and people didn't act on it? Well, the hard part of communication is getting an audience. Uh, simply sending the information back does not guarantee it will be used, as we've all learned in the sciences. Um, look, the, the problem with climate change is really not so much information, it's economics. I mean, the reason we haven't done a lot about it is that you're asking to dismantle and replace the second largest industry in the world. Number one is farming. Um, so there are powerful interests, for example, everybody, who say, gee, I do want my home heated in the winter and air conditioning in the summer and I want to travel easily and taking that away from them, excuse me just one second, I got rid of that, um, uh, it's very hard. I mean, I mean, you know, I always say to people, remember that it's not love that makes the world go around, it's inertia. <laughs> and inertia dominates human society. That's why we're responding slowly, and that's why I think uh, the program will fail on the larger scale, because, look, we've been trying carbon restriction, or what I call carbon prohibition, for 30 years, and it hasn't worked. In a way, it's a, 
look at look on the large scale of time for human beings. How did prohibition of alcohol work out? How did prohibition of drugs work out, the war on drugs? Uh, prohibitions don't work well in human societies because we like our freedom. Uh, so that's why I've moved on, well, gosh, 25 years ago to studying geoengineering because I think we're going to have to have a forceful solution on the scale of a decade or two. And it's politically incorrect, but it will happen. Uh, I mean, that's my view of climate change is that you have to keep in mind the nature of human societies and prohibition, which is the common reflex of most political people, does not work. So that, that's my view. It's not just a matter of the message. It's a matter well, of the message. Well, geoengineering, you need lots of infra infrastructure in space. And so far, we don't see that. And also investments uh, in space aren't, let's see, uh, so great. So. How do you think we could change that? And uh, oh. do you have any favorite space mission that's ongoing, recent, or upcoming? Well, I'm always in favor of SpaceX because I've been an old friend of Elon Musk. And you'll notice he's actually getting things done, whereas uh, Elephantine governments are not, particularly NASA, which is basically a jobs program instead of a frontier program. Uh, I. Uh, I think uh, in terms of space missions, I, I actually wrote a whole novel about this, The Martian Race, which depicts people going to Mars in order to win a prize, which is, by the way, how the Europeans explored much of the world. Uh, the British would issue challenges, so to speak, saying, look, you bring us back a ship from this thing we heard about called uh, Singapore, and we'll pay you for it, and you also deliver us the map route. So. It was a reward-based structure. Well, the same thing happens in that novel. But the trick is they explore the underground of Mars and find that there is life that originated there billions of years ago and has retreated to the subsurface. This was uh, brought to my mind when I started learning that subsurface on Earth is extremely large. That is, there, some biologists have estimated that the mass of, of biologically active uh, both plants and microbes beneath the surface is larger than that where we live above the surface. That's yeah. an astonishing fact. <laughs> yeah, that might be so. And I also think that uh, the subsurface of Mars is a great place to uh, look for life. So I'm th thrilled about uh, the ExoMars mission by ESA uh, and the Rosalind Franklin rover. Because, right. of course, we're also getting NASA Mars 2020, but the drill is uh, only approximately 10 centimeters deep, which doesn't really get you anywhere where mm. uh, there might be any intact molecules. So, yes. two meters, that's much better. The Mars program is dominated by geologists who just want to do geology forever. You know, there's only been one biology experiment, the first one, the Viking landers, and that was at the surface which we now know is extremely unhospitable to life. Uh, so the only way on a real time scale of a few decades to explore this is to go into the caves and lava tubes of Mars, of which we know hundreds. That's the easy way to get under the surface, not drilling. Um, and that will give you access to perhaps the microbial world beneath the surface of Mars. It works on Earth. I've been up lava tubes uh, in the Hawaiian Islands and you'd be amazed only a few hundred meters in, you can find life forms that don't exist outside those tubes. And of course, in, in deep caves, life forms living off uh, sulfur dioxide and so forth are common. Inhospitable to us, but good for them. Yeah, and I mean, we can see uh, life in ice caves on Mount Erebus on Antarctica, and we can see life in Lake Vostok. And there actually is evidence from Mars Express about uh, subglacial lakes underneath the Martian polar ice caps, at least the south, uh, south one. You don't know about the northern ice caps. Yes. So. And then there's the methane emissions, which are unexplained. Yeah. So I mean, how would you go about exploring these regions uh, on Mars with current technology if you could propose a program? Well, actually, we did work on this way back in the 1990s uh, when I was a consultant at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, 
the current form is you need some resources on the ground. Uh, you need to put down a rover that can communicate electrically by microwave back to relays when it enters a cave, for example, back to a base that's sitting outside and will re re the information to the Earth. Uh, in other words, you need uh, what's in journalism called stringers. People are out there somewhere and are reporting back. And that's the easiest way. Make a rover that's running not on wheels, but on a grid, uh, on a tank-like traction, and sit it into caves. And uh, nuclear power can't run on solar. And that's, that's a, a program you could do right now. But the geologists run the program, and they're not interested in life. They say they are, but it's phony. And uh, they're mostly, they say, water is the key to life. Well, yeah, but, oh, have you noticed that there's not any water on this one? <laughs> On the other hand, there seems to be uh, more traction now for the Mars Center Return Program. And actually, the European Astrobiology Institute uh, is also uh, moving in this direction. So uh, what do you think of that? Um, how would you personally handle samples from Mars because of planetary protection? Well, you're adding an enormous problem bringing a sample back. But the problem is, why do you think you would take the sample on the surface and learn much from it? It's been sitting in a bath of cosmic rays in ultraviolet for billions of years. Yeah, it needs to be subsurface, but actually with Rosalind Franklin, it will be subsurface if only shallow. Right. I mean, th that's a, another geology program. After all, as we said, we brought back a lot of rocks from the moon, but we didn't learn anything about biology, did we? No, we got geology. Um, so it requires imagination and it requires that you go deep because we don't even know the depth of the Earth's microbial zone. We don't know how far life goes, although we do know it's at least kilometers, and therefore is an enormous zone. Uh, after all, most of the life on the surface lies only in the first kilometer above the surface. So uh, again, you need imagination. But, but one of the problems we all face is that governments are not big on imagination. They're big on what, what do they need tomorrow. Um, and so it's up to dreamers and schemers like you and me uh, to think of these things. And uh, one of the reasons I really think Elon Musk is a sign of true progress is that he's a wild and crazy guy. And he can send things to Mars on a scale of maybe a decade. So he's much more likely to do this sort of thing. After all, he wants to go there himself. Yeah, but actually, one thing I'm worried about um, with regard to SpaceX and Mars is planetary protection and, I mean, uh, in forward contamination because we could easily uh, bring Earth microbes on Mars with improper sterilization. And if there is a crewed mission, then we will basically, uh, for certainty, uh, contaminate Mars with Earth microbes because mm -hmm. we can never sterilize spacesuits and anything where humans have been completely. No, you, humans are a very real problem, but it's, it, it, we've undoubtedly sent microbes to Mars and it landed on the surface and they're undoubtedly dead because it's a, it's a virulent environment. Um, I don't think there is a real answer to perfection in uh, a, a contamination problems. I mean, that, you know, Perfection is not available in this in this universe. So uh, that's why I think the thing to do is to send a smart rover with some biological capabilities. You know, if you see something, pull it in, put it under a microscope, do some DNA testing, that kind of thing. You can automate that. You don't have to bring it all the way back to the Earth. And you can do that in a smart rover. And the rovers are getting smarter and smarter and smarter. But there are certain boundaries that, that ESA and NASA won't cross. For example, they appear to be frightened of nuclear power sources. Uh, that's what killed that asteroid uh, mission that ESA had several years ago. Uh, if you just had the courage to put a radioactive source on it, it wouldn't have gone dead because it was not in the sunlight. Duh. Uh, I, I mean, you, you have to be robust in this study. If you're, if you're carrying out a search under extreme constraints, the chances of success are extremely small. Well, by the way, do you think uh, there's any reason why science fiction uh, 
doesn't deal with planetary protection very often because usually we see people exploring an alien planet or some artifact mm -hmm. without even mentioning this issue. Well, it's the same way that mystery stories usually don't trouble you with the rules of evidence because that's used later in court I mean, and it's not exciting. Actually, I wrote a long time ago uh, a story called All the Beer on Mars, which is now on Mars. It's in the disc that we landed on the surface that has all this, this literature and art about Mars. Uh, and I published that story, I think, in the 1980s, uh, in which you land on Mars and you find traces of life, and it turns out that the source is a Russian lander that crashed decades before. And... Uh, you haven't learned anything about life on Mars, except that it's apparently ours. Uh, that's why the subsurface is so important. It's been insulated from us for a long time. Probably is related, of course, because Mars cooled off first. If there was life there, rocks splatting into it might have scattered to the Earth and started life here. Yeah, um, actually, the same might be true for past Venus, because uh, it's also quite likely that it had liquid ocean, wa uh, liquid water oceans for some time before it turned into the greenhouse hell it is now. Mm. Um, Lots of luck trying to find that. <laughs> do you Very think right. it's uh, worth it sending uh, mm -hmm. a life-finding mission into the clouds of Venus where theoretically microbes might persist? That's, that's worth doing, probably with a balloon. And that region does have a lot of sulfuric acid vapor in it, so it's, the craft is not going to sort of survive a long time, maybe. Uh, and it's like these things about let's look for subsurface life in, say, Europa, or uh, which I think is going to be very hard after all. It's hard to get through kilometers deep ice. You can't do that without an enormous thermal source. Titan is more interesting, and that's why I like this uh, this latest mission which a friend of mine, Ron Michael Levine, is working on. Uh, let's fly around on Titan uh, and look at stuff. Uh, there's some possibility that life could proceed at those low temperatures in the middle of basically an atmosphere of uh, methane and on um, lakes of ethane. Yeah. I mean, it's a long shot, but it's an easier shot. That's the main point. You take your easy shots first. On this note, uh, what do you think is the likeliest location or let's say exotic life uh, based on another solvent than water or with another backbone than uh, carbon based uh, and you know location that we could explore uh, within let's say a century realistically. Well, we don't know any environments like that that seem to have uh, thermodynamic excesses that could be exploited by life. And as usual, it's, it's always a body of water somewhere and operating on some oxygen-based chemistry, maybe. But uh, in hotter environments, of course, you could do uh, sulfur-based biology or even extremely hot environments, you could use fluorine-based uh, life about which we know nothing. Uh, we don't even do those experiments. I mean, there are a few small lab experiments about sulfur-based reactions, but nobody's going to try to see if you could create life forms that way. We can't even create life forms uh, like this, the, the Stanley Miller experiments uh, from scratch. I mean, all you could get is the ingredients, and that was the 1950s. Yeah, but on the other hand, it's extremely tough to explore uh, these possibilities that we don't really have on Earth. Uh, and one of them is also uh, great pressure and to yes. That in the behavior of materials uh, under big pressures, we need uh, tiny uh, chambers with diamond anvils. And it's mm. amazing how much we've learned uh, using only this earth based approach that we can do. True. Uh, the problem is, even the earth based approach, we can't create life in the lab. A powerful clue that this is a really tough problem. And, uh, actually, the easiest thing we can do if you want to look at these exotic chemistries, not oxygen-based, is to go into deep caverns on the Earth. We still have not gone as far deep as caverns we already know of. There's one that Penny Boston, for example, at NASA, Ames, has explored a great deal uh, south of here, somewhere in Mexico, in, in which you have to go in all suited up because it's completely deadly for us. 
But she hasn't gone to the deepest parts because it's hard to get there. It's a long way down, and there's only so much gear you can drag along with you. So she's got the right idea. This is a tough problem just to get to a distant non-oxygen environment right here, never mind on other worlds. Yeah, it's also one of the locations where we might test life detection rovers or, or other kinds of probes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, uh, rovers are very limited. Uh, I mean, we should first do these things on the Earth. Uh, uh, the, the, there's another lady at NASA Images who helped me with the Martian race. I've forgotten her name now. Uh, and she's exploring these extremely uh, isolated lakes uh, uh, near the Atacama Desert. And what are the life forms there at the bottom of these lakes? And still plenty of them. Uh, yeah. I mean, even uh, in, uh, let's say, the very shallow levels of Atacama soil, there right. is life, uh, which is usually uh, inactive for most of the time. But when it rains, it sort of blooms. So uh, right. there have been some environmental sequencing studies. Uh, Dirk schultz mm -hmm. uh did some research there. So it's amazing. And it's uh, a clue that we might expect some uh, chances of life on Mars because in past it might have been a bit like Atacama, you know, still right. with water near the surface, of course, without free oxygen in the atmosphere, but uh, right. otherwise not so different. Yeah. Uh, and there, these Martian analogs are really worth exploring and, and very few people are doing this, which is a shame because it's, it's a good opportunity. There's some effort to, uh, you know, uh, popularize and also protect field science within the Institute. So hopefully uh, yeah. that will happen. But uh, if we discovered life uh, outside of the Earth, be it on Mars or in the clouds of Venus or on Europa or Enceladus, it would be uh, a life-changing event for all of humanity. And do you think that uh, this would have an impact on the educational system like the Sputnik launch had in the 50s? Well, Sputnik, which greatly affected my life because I was right at the right age in uh, 16 in 1957, uh, and it, drove, it opened many doors for me to go into science. Before that, I thought I would just maybe do something like be a science fiction writer. Only later did it occur to me that I could do both. Um, but. Uh, that impinged on a direct human arrival rate with the duly departed Soviet Union. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the fact that there might be life elsewhere and the evidence that there is would inspire people like you and me and children. But it's not going to change human society because it's too distant. It's like knowing something about people in, in uh, say, on the other side of the planet. Until recently, nobody cared. Um, our, I, but in terms of where are we in the universe, it's a profound issue. Uh, and everybody's interested in life elsewhere. You know, this goes back to the ancient Greeks. Yeah. But uh, you mentioned in uh, one of your essays that uh, Sputnik has, uh, you know, um, changed the American education system uh, in the way that within just one year from the launch, uh, there has been more advanced calculus and science mm -hmm. subjects added to the curriculum, you know, to improve uh, right. chances of people getting into science and achieving, uh, let's say, other mm -hmm. marks, space race. Enormously influential. It changed everything. Uh, but that was an era when the, the U.S. federal government could turn on a dime and produce a whole new educational program in nine months. These people can't get a bill through Congress that fast. Uh, we've become uh, lethargic and, as I said, inertia dominated. Uh, so, other than the severe shock, I don't see anything changes like that. But let's remember that uh, the advanced space flight capabilities in the world is now owned by one guy <laughs> who, who, a la Robert A. Heinlein, said, you know, why don't we go and do these things? Elon told me the last time I had dinner over at this place in Beverly Hills that uh, he wants to be buried on Mars. And I, I said, well, that solves a major problem. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, you don't need a return vessel. 
<laughs> he said, well, that's, I guess that's true. Uh, so, uh, uh, it's crazy ambitions like that, as depicted in the Robert Heinlein's story, The Man Who Sold the Moon, uh, is that he wanted to get there so he could die there. He knew he was going to die. Why not die in a place that's significant? Um, uh, that's the kind of crazy people uh, we need because, look, that's how we colonize the Americas. Crazy people who would sell over, sail over the horizon and set up in a, an environment they didn't know very well and take big casualties. Um, you have to be a little crazy to achieve great things. Um, in terms of exploring space, is there any place you wish we have visited more or any kind of dream mission that you'd like to see launched? Or? Well, there are things we haven't done and we could. For example, we now have over 26 million high resolution down to a scale of a meter or so photographs of the moon. 4% of those photos have been looked at. <laughs> so if you want to go back to that earlier idea of you know, a craft that lands on the moon, on this side of the moon, that cuts the search in half, uh, and studies the Earth, then uh, we should be looking at those photos on a scale in case there's something that was left there a billion years ago and is still great evidence, uh, and we haven't done it. Basically, all what I see as a major improvement recently is citizen science, where people from all kinds of backgrounds look at images of uh, mm -hmm. planets and moons in the solar system or distant galaxies yeah. and stars and categorize them and help catalog them. So I think that's great, you know, to even in terms of geology or uh, stellar evolution to uh, understand the involved processes better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, true. I mean, SETI at home, for example, was a great yeah, program. Exactly. It's just been discontinued, you probably have. Um, but there could be a program to look at the photos of the moon, which we have. They're all in a cache saved at the Arizona State University. Uh, and we could just have people look at them. Uh, in fact, there's software that can look at them, uh, but hasn't yet. I, I suggested to the head of that program there that they just look for linear structures. Uh, look for straight lines first. Of course, you're going to turn off lava tubes and some fissures and so forth, fine. But it's a beginning. And if you just took all of those that a software gives you and then turn it over to humans, that's a program. And it's free. The humans work for free. Yeah. <laughs> software yeah. costs money. <laughs> <laughs> Do you uh, have any uh, new writing plans? Because now, uh, your novel Glorious, written with Larry Niven, has just been published. Uh, yes. So if you want uh, to tell viewers more about that or uh, upcoming uh, fiction. Well, Larry and I, a decade ago, I started kicking around the ideas of uh, what other kind of structures would, could there be in the galaxy beyond his original one, Ringworld, which everyone knows. And someday he might get made into a really good movie. Uh, it's always hopeful. Um, and so I started thinking about this, and I thought of some earlier uh, Russian ideas about the Sudarkov engines and so forth. We put together the bowl of heaven, which is a hemisphere like this, gliding through space. It's driven by a star about right here, and it moves this way because it's being maneuvered with a jet of plasma off the star. And so, so it's a really complicated device that we made up uh, and just as an example of some kind of crazy idea that a truly advanced, uh, crazy smart civilization could be used. And now in this last novel, the third, the bowl of heaven and some humans on the bowl and in a ship reach the target star they were all headed for, which is why they intersected. Uh, With a the <laughs> And there you found and find another large structure because uh, <clears throat> I was inspired by Pluto and Charon. Isn't it interesting that in this little skimpy solar system with a planet that some say is not a planet, da -da, Pluto, it's a double world. I mean, it has a large moon and they orbit like this, always facing each other. And they yeah, didn't. Like Pluto and Charon. Right. The point is, the Earth moon system is half of that. The moon is always looking at us, but we spin because of inertia again. Um, so Pluto and Charon are always looking at each other. So what about 
a planetary system in which these worlds are inhabited and you build a structure between them. That's the idea in Glorious. Mm -hmm. And the point is, it's an enormous living volume, most of it in very, very light gravity. So mm -hmm. what would you evolve to make use of that? Uh, it, it's, it was an intriguing problem. We've been heading toward it in a decade. It took us to write these novels. And now we've done it, and here's the last book, which seems to be selling very well. Um, and uh, it was fun because we, all the way through these books, we've incorporated some art. I always like to see art in books, and almost no one does it. So I got my old friend Don Davis, an astronomical artist, to uh, do some paintings for it. And in this book, we also have Brenda Guerre, uh, a, a line drawing artist, to do other things for, to depict mysterious alien things. And so we got 46 pieces of art in this last book, um, which you can only see in their full glory on an electronic book where you can see the color. But the print book has got it in black and white. So it's this kind of fun I like to have with books. Mm -hmm. uh, to always do something different. Uh, so uh, uh, the next novel I'm about to finish is uh, about um, the... SETI library on the moon two centuries from now, and a woman astronomer, Rachel Cohen, who begins to study the, the alien messages that have come in, because you see a really sophisticated, and this is the one major idea in the novel, sophisticated SETI message is not just a, here we are, here's a diagram and so forth, they're all the stuff we've seen before. A really sophisticated message is a piece of software, which you can run on a computer, zeros and ones, and that software is the ambassador from the other culture that will interact with you and deliver stuff it knows about its culture, but also can do, it's a diplomat in a way. Of course, it may be a diplomat for a culture that died a million years ago, but it's still there and the software still runs. That's the context of the novel. And how do you interact with those kinds of minds? The leftover software from ancient Alien civilizations. That uh, reminds me in a uh, kind of different way of existence by David Brin, because yeah. there you also have these ambassadors. Uh, but uh, what I loved about it is that uh, it sort of turns the idea of interstellar communication uh, in a different direction than it's usually used. And yes. uh, not to use spoilers, it's all. Uh, takes from ecosystems and from, uh, let's say, viral transmission. Yes. So do you think something like that could happen in reality? And perhaps that, you know, proliferation of, uh, let's call them alien spam bots, could what? be the reasons behind the Fermi paradox? Well, I, I do think it could ha happen. <clears throat> Whether it will or has happened is a difficult question. It requires more judgment than we can have. But I always remember what Freeman Dyson said to me long ago, is the important thing in studying such a vast problem is to not ask what will be done, but rather what's physically possible to do. Because if it's possible, then who knows? Uh, there are many things about the archaeology of our own past that continues to instruct us, for example. Um, and what you need is the, the relevant Rosetta, Rosetta Stone. Uh, I always like, and that's mentioned in this uh, next book, the, the title of which, by the way, and will be out for at least a year, is uh, Shadows of Eternity, because that's what you're looking at when you're looking at messages from great distances. You're looking at a long time axis. Um, the Rosetta Stone was turned up by an infantryman who was instructed to get enough stones together to build a latrine for the French army when they invaded Egypt under Napoleon. And he, there was a big stone and he called an officer over and said, look, there's all this stuff on this stone. And the officer was smart enough to say, you know, maybe we ought to look into this. And they took the Rosetta Stone away and it enabled us to, to link together three different written symbolic languages. That's the kind of accident you want to happen. The point is the stone had been there for 2,000 years. <laughs> Nobody had noticed that. <laughs> what else have we not noticed? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, 
before we wrap up the interview, uh, is there any question you wish people asked you in interviews and heaven? Um, yes, uh, how did you grow, you and your twin brother, grow up in farm country of southern Alabama and, uh, and end up being public intellectuals? Well, the answer is the system of that era of advanced people of intelligence, no matter their origin. And that happened to us. I mean, we grew up in Southern Alabama, and then because my father became an army officer, see, I'm answering the question. Uh, uh, we lived three years in occupied Japan, three years in occupied German, Germany, learned German and Russian, a little bit of Japanese. And so by the time we had graduated from high school, we were enormously more sophisticated just because of travel to other cultures, although I haven't been abroad, uh, been meaning to. Um, I mean, I've been to 80 countries. Uh, I like travel, and, and travel is contact with the alien or the semi-alien. So, and so that's how I got here. Uh, uh, if you, you open doors and people can walk through them. That's the real clue. But that's why the United States has done well. Uh, that plus the fact that whenever things get bad somewhere else, the smart people get out of that place and they come here. <laughs> We've benefited enormously from that. Send us your smart people. <laughs> or rather let your smart people escape and come here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, big deal. I, I say that since the first Benford came to the United States in 1641. We've been here a while. So do you have any message for the readers of Strangest of All and for anyone interested in astrobiology? Well, read broadly. Uh, read the many, many good books that are about biology and, and, and about its, its influence. For example, here, I can reach up and show you. This is a very good book, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Yeah. About I love that. Yeah. It's, it's a, the second edition has got a special, an actual chapter on Japan, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, Gerard is a friend of mine. And uh, uh, this will give you perspective on our planet, a good place to start, and how come we become sophisticated enough to, yeah, also to, the third chimpanzee is also good. Like, sorry, the third, the, which one? The third chimpanzee. Oh, third chimpanzee, yes, it's right over here. <laughs> also, mm -hmm. um, that's a terrific book. It also has a second edition, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are the third chimpanzee, and that's important to realize because we're really, really smart apes. Uh, and nothing like us has happened before. You've got to ask yourself, how come the dinosaurs never evolved intelligence? And the reason is the subtle forces of natural selection didn't favor intelligence. Um, and come on, it's been 4.5 billion years, folks. And you get one one tool-using species. That's the trick. You see, the dolphins are fairly, in, fairly intelligent. They have a, 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 a cerebral cortex factor that is 0. 0.8 of ours. They're very good, but they can't make tools. And the interaction between our minds and our hand-making tools apparently spelled the, the, the... I mean, many birds can do that, oh, especially corvids are very yeah. clever. The corvids yeah. are very fast, and the parakeets can talk. <laughs> Actually, you inspired uh, a new last question uh, with mentioning Jared Diamond and uh, the uh -huh. human nature, because uh, you also co-wrote uh, a book about... Uh, the, let's say cyborgization and augmentation of humans, but uh, oh, in yeah. your fiction, uh, the humans we see are very much like we are today, only with increased lifespans and so on. But they aren't, let's say, heavily augmented or cognitively mm -hmm. different. So, uh, what uh, what is the difference there? And do you think that we should go in the way of? Uh, let's say, enhancing ourselves uh, in a way that will make us less recognizable to current humans? Uh, well, I think the first issue is to say, should we or shouldn't we, we'll differ about that. The point is, should we have the freedom to do it? Uh, I, I, the European point of view is more of, should people be allowed to do it? My point of view is as a libertarian. Well, sure, I mean, what gives you the mandate to restrict their ability to do it? Um, the, if people want to take that risk, let them take that risk. Um, I've always thought that, you know, the standard 
exciting story is about somebody else doing something dangerous at some distance from you. <laughs> so you may not want to augment yourself, but somebody will do it. We got over seven billion people here, and there's obviously nothing much on TV, so let's augment ourselves. <laughs> uh, so it, it will be done. Uh, you can try to constrain it, but again, prohibition doesn't work in free society. So people will do it. But what about uh, in science fiction, you know, uh, like I mentioned, most characters in your stories are very human and, uh, you know, we could say deeply human. So uh, why not make them very different? Well, I, in this latest novel, The Shadows of Eternity, I do have the woman's point of view character having to mention that she has inboards, I call them. That's inboard computational or other processing stuff. It's it's so commonplace you just not even remark on it. Same way, don't we don't really talk about the miracle of the telephone anymore, um, or even the airplane. Uh, so it will become customary, but where it leads, no one knows. You know, we're the only species that really gets around usefully on two legs and does not have a tail or wings. Uh, um, and our way of moving forward is to fall forward and catch ourselves. It's not nearly as safe as those four-legged creatures who are always very safe, right? I mean, you've always got several legs on the ground at any time. Um, but we fall forward and catch ourselves, and that's a very telling distinction. If you don't pay attention, you fall flat on your face. <laughs> it's the history of the old species. <laughs> a work in progress. And look, we're only a few hundred thousand years old. Okay, I think uh, this is a nice way to wrap up the interview. Good. Thank you so much for talking with us and for contributing your stories. Sure. So before we end recording, uh, I'll just remind, remind the viewers that Strangest of All is freely available on the websites of the European Astrobiology Institute and myself. And if you want to visit Gregory Benford's website, go to gregorybenford.com and you can read some of his blog posts and his bibliography there. Yeah. Right. Or look so, at my Facebook page. Or both. <laughs> so thank you so much. Sure thing. Happy day. to do so. Mm -hmm.